Demons in the modern world are taboo figures, conjuring up feelings of terror and fear. We might think about Pazuzu taking possession of the body of the young girl and the exorcist. We might think about the goat-headed Baphomet, a symbol of witchcraft often in the occult. But in the ancient Egyptian pharaonic world, demons weren't always so terrifying, and what we call demons were part of the everyday universe. Like so many of us today, for the ancient Egyptians, magical thinking, which is the need to solicit help from the gods, for instance, to define an ailment or petition some force from beyond to end their hardships, this magical thinking helped them deal with everyday problems, issues like loneliness, hunger, and disease. Welcome to the OI Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Townsend, and I am joined today by Rita Lucarelli from the University of Berkeley. And today we are going to be talking about demons. We've hit on demons a little bit with our talks with uh, Robert Rittner and Foy Scalf and Illyria Caridi. It's a, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. In 2009, I was working on a, a book for Dungeons and Dragons with Mike Merle's and Brian James called Demonomicon. And back in that day, we, you know, in D&D, Demons are very assigned to one side of the aisle and devils to the other. Demons go out to destroy the world and devils are there to corrupt it. I think it's actually an example of uh, how uh, pop culture utilizes iconographies and conceptions of mm. primordial figures, uh, monsters, demons, uh, uh, to shape them uh, in more defined ontologies, we could say, uh, because our need uh, when... Uh, uh, facing uh, these strange realities of monsters and demons is um, always to try to catalog them one by one, almost controlling them, ordering them in categories uh, alphabetically or by their function. And uh, we have to think anyway, when we talk about demonologies, demons, monsters in antiquity, that this was this didn't really happen. We do not have a real uh, demonological discourse in ancient Egypt. And this is why actually I'm writing a book on it. I, I'm making this modern demonological discourse but monsters demons in ancient Egypt in antiquity in general were uh, uh, very ambiguous figures that uh, we cannot define and put in a catalog very easily let's say that in our western mind very often also defined by religious and especially Catholic religion monsters demons needs to need to be hunted down uh, they have to be given name control them rationalize them and in a book on monsters actually in uh, pop culture by Liz Gloin which I was reading recently the author speaks uh, of a very interesting concept uh, cryptozoology Try to find the historical origins of fantastic creatures, sure. which is not easy at all. Uh, for instance, for ancient Egypt, we have this giant snake attacking the, uh, the sunboat, Apophis. Scholars have been trying to find out, is Apophis a python snake? Mm -hmm. um, since it's like since we think those creatures do not exist, we have to find find the real historical origin. So this is our modern approach a bit when we read about ancient mythologies, mm -hmm. and then uh, those are transformed in pop cultures, in series on TV. But my interest is not really in finding out. Uh, what is the historical uh, um, correspondent to those strange creatures, uh, but actually to look at their function within the society where they act. Look, what is a demon? What, how do we, what, what do you think? What, how do you classify them? Well, uh, demon, the word, um, we use it uh, in all kinds of religions, also in ancient Egypt, but it's a convention. It's a modern word coming from ancient Greek, but it's a word that cannot be translated in all the ancient languages. For instance, in ancient Egyptians, we don't have one word that we can translate with demon. But we have different kinds of creatures, which I think are very close to a general category of uh, liminal beings that we can call demons. In my book, I actually decided to call uh, demons 
agents, agents of protection, of punishment, of disease. I also then talk about revenants and ghosts. They have a specific agency as well. I do that because their agency is what helped me to see them, individualize them, recognize them among a huge number of divine beings that we found in the ancient Egyptian sources. So what scholars have been calling major and minor gods, blessed spirits of the dead, damned spirits of the dead, inhabitants of the netherworld of all type, invisible powers, dif different kind of uh, um, liminal presences. While we are used to see uh, agency, agency meaning uh, acting for producing something. Uh, so we see agency as something mainly human. And for those who believe, of course, in uh, gods or in one god, also as a divine uh, um, quality. Uh, but in many cultures, ancient and modern agency applies also to the world of animals and plants, for instance. So I've been inspired a lot in my work uh, recently uh, by anthropological studies, like an anthropologist, uh, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, and the book is called Cannibal Metaphysics. And here I have a quote, when everything is human, the human is an, an entire mm. different thing. Eduardo Viveros de Castro even went further writing the trees, plants, uh, animals not only have an agency, but also have inner personas, exactly like humans, even if they don't look like. And so it's a notion that is also known as uh, perspectivism, which I find useful because when uh, approaching ancient demons, we can read their names, we can see how they look like, but we don't really know what the ancient Egyptians talked about this creature. Mm -hmm. And so we should um, uh, realize that there are different perspectives and that, for instance, also um, for demons uh, being uh, represented, like in those figures that I selected with the hybrid bodies, with objects as part of his bodies. This was not a way for the ancient Egyptian to describe something uh, monstrous or something uh, negative, but actually was um, they were seeing those creatures also as uh, agents of protection. So as uh, composite bodies uh, that could have a function uh, also towards humanity. So they, they could protect humans on earth and in the netherworld. So this is why in my book, I distinguish this kind of different, different agents. Can I ask you about the ones we're looking at right here? It looks like uh, a, a, a headless torso with lo what looks like knives. And then it right. looks like a woman with a lizard and a snake and what- exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, should we define those monsters? Monsters uh, are frightening. Are those creatures frightening? Maybe for us they are because we see all these snakes and knives, um, non-human uh, creatures, but those were protectors. These okay. images came from um, um, a funerary magical papyri uh, protecting the, 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 the dead. And they were... Uh, they had a function that could be also potentially dangerous, but not for the deceased who know their names and they, how they look like. And so the, the knives um, are an expression of power as well as uh, the snake uh, or the, the lizard, the whole, whole um, which is um, in the in the ends of the of the female figure, and the the, the body indeed not only the, the names of those demons but the bodies are very important because uh, uh, they are they are a physical visible evidence of their agency. So by seeing knives. Uh, part of a body of a demon, it means that this is a defensive function that the demon has in the place he guards, or for the mummified body of the, of the deceased, which is also uh, connected to Osiris. So do these particular figures have names in particular, or are they, yes. oh, they do? 
Can, will you tell us or will that invoke, invoke right. them? <laughs> yeah, I have name. I have many names. So we okay. don't have indeed the word for demons in ancient Egypt, Egyptian, but we have many names, epithets given to these creatures. So we have collective names. We have gangs of demons. They are not uh, um, individualized, but they act as a gang. And mm -hmm. so those are called the watchers, the murderers, the wanderers, or the squatting ones. And they are represented, for instance, in this early Middle Kingdom coffins, where they guard places, or again, in those magical papyri with those uh, creatures, hybrid creatures holding knives. So those are what we can maybe call uh, demons or demones in the Greek way in ancient Egypt. And the name also expressed their agency, expressed their main function. We also have uh, anyway individualized demons uh, and I selected three among many examples which are really uh, have in their name uh, self-evident their agency. We have have uh, one who lives on worms is also one of those guardians of gates in the netherworld, Anke and Fenichu. Then we have uh, one who sees by night and fetches by day. He never sleeps, basically. It's this Maem, Gerech, Hinenef, and Heru. And we have the one who overthrows the catfish, the Seher Hajj. Some of these names also refer to ancient myths, and those myths are never told um, in full. So there are only allusions to, to the myths and sometimes we don't even understand what they are about. So we have many names and those it's are... really fun to, to work on those names to understand also sometimes just what they, what they mean, what these words mean. Those are, those are great names for demons. He who lives on worms, he who sees by night and fetches by day. Uh, and he, now I, overthrowing the catfish, I, I read in a history book um, that uh, Narmer, I think, meant baleful catfish. He was like the first unifier of Egypt. Is that right? Maybe yeah, the second? Um Yes, yes, it is. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not connected to this discourse, but he has uh, the fish. But I don't the, it, my understanding was that the catfish is seen as a fierce uh, fish. Is that right in ancient Egypt? Yes, or? it is okay. um, a very um, still also difficult to understand uh, uh, meaning and it, it, it can be a dangerous uh, symbol, a sort of uh, uh, dangerous kind of fish. It's interesting to work on those uh, names as well as see also some specific demons figures, if we want to call it demons, or also non-demons but similar to demons, like Amemut, uh, probably you heard this name, is she's very fa famous, Amemet, or the devourer of the dead, and uh, Apopis. So, for instance, Amemet always um, uh, is found in uh, only in one context, which is a spell of the Book of the Dead, uh, spell 125 on the final judgment. And uh, she's depicted as what we could call today probably a monster, but I like to call fantastic beast or fantastic animals because it has the rear of an hippopotamus, uh, the forepart of a lion, the head of a crocodile, but she has a very limited function. She's only there waiting for the dead not passing the final judgment so she can eat his earth, his or her hurt. This never happens because the disease always has all the knowledge, necessary knowledge from the Book of the Dead to pass through the judgment. And so the poor Amemet um, stay, stays hungry. Really? But the creature with a very limited function. Uh, and so shall we define it demon, monster? I don't think uh, really matters if we see it uh, from an, an ancient Egyptian emic perspective in which Amemet is just this composite animal uh, attending the final judgment. And another very special creature is Apopis that we, or Apep in Egyptian, 
we already mentioned, uh, always appearing in a very specific context as well, which is attacking the solar boat uh, every day. In this uh, case, we have uh, the god Set, who is uh, in his function of protector of the sun boat. So Set, words of Apophis, the giant snakes. Apophis ne is never killed. He will come back the day after, will attack again. And this way is part of creation. It's part of the cycle of day and night, uh, life and death. So it's an important element. We cannot say that uh, this is uh, an evil creature in the sense of ethics. It's maybe more of a, a cosmic evil. And I will not define it as a demon because of this very specific function within creation, while demons do not occur in accounts of creation. Apophis is more of an arch enemy and a colleague of mine define it as an anti-God. Um, arch enemies that we can find in other accounts of uh, the, the beginning of the world, also in other religions. So. It's sounding a lot like for instance, the Midgard serpent, uh, right. you know, an anti-god. Or the Leviathan. The other image you can see is, is a hieroglyph. It's the hieroglyph uh, representing Apophis with knives in his coiled body in order to um, immobilize, um, um, to stop him. So it's um, also very representative, a nice image of how Apophis is always stopped, ward off never killed but stopped i often hear set really villainized among the gods but you said that he is the one who's spearing apophis right set is a very interesting figure because he appears also demonized in other kind of text like um, magical text uh, where demons are very present and indeed uh, i have here a couple of figures, a sketch and uh, the original photo of a papyrus, which has been uh, recently published by Fisher Effert and Hoffman. This is a new publication. To, um, I was very happy to see that because this papyrus kept in Athens contained very interesting spells on uh, dangerous demons, the demons of daily life that bring uh, illness and disease. And uh, there is a very peculiar sketch in this papyrus that you can see here where Set is the typical Set face, the Set animal. Uh, the uh, Set is carrying the mummified, so the dead body of Osiris probably. And this motive of Set carrying the mummified body of Osiris comes from the myth in which Set kills Osiris. And they are... Um, uh, brothers and so set wants the throne of Osiris, uh, uh, which instead will go to Horus, uh, and while Osiris will become the king of the dead. So the myth of Osiris, where set is also protagonist, is very present in magical spells from ancient Egypt, and the set becomes now not anymore the protector of the sun god, but the idea, the personification of the enemy. And this concept of enemy, hefet, um, in ancient Egyptians, and here you can see how it's written in uh, uh, hieroglyphs, the hefeti, the, the enemy, is very important because all kind of uh, dangerous demons uh, uh, wandering on earth and bringing plague and disease to humankind are considered enemies. Even you can see the, the hieroglyph of effety of enemy is written with the determinative of the of a man with tied arms under his back. So it's, um, it's basically the, um, the hieroglyph of the uh, prisoner, so the, the the same treatment that was given to war prisoners. And uh, Set, uh, Horus, Osiris, all those gods uh, of the myth uh, are very much um, mentioned in these uh, magical spells against dangerous demons. So it, it's really in order to understand demons in ancient Egypt, you have to know about the gods, where there is a demon, Generally, there is also God. They go together. If we can distinguish them, but they go together. Where where do the demons? Do they live among the gods, or were seen to live among the gods? There are those inhabitants of the netherworld, which are mostly those agents of protection. But there are also some agents of punishment and disease in the netherworld. Uh, 
they seem to live in the netherworld in the places where they guard. But the most dangerous one, and those I would like to focus on today, are the uh, those demons sent by the gods or by angry goddesses on earth, bringing plague, disease. And I thought since we are living in the middle of a pandemic, it would be nice to see those magical spells where the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptians demonized those uh, plagues, those illnesses uh, as demons. They gave name to, the, to those or the, the name of an illness becomes the personification, uh, indeed um, a personification. So uh, the, the demon is the personification of an illness. One of the most important sources uh, for our understanding also of the ancient Egyptian medicine and medical practices is uh, Papyrus Edwin Smith. Uh, which has been actually published uh, is part of uh, the Oriental Institute publications. Uh, originally, the first facsimile is a very well-written papyrus uh, um, full of uh, very important medical prescriptions, but also inc uh, magical incantations. So medicine and magic go together here. And it's in interesting to see how, for instance, when they talk about the plague, there is a word for uh, the plague of the year, the Yadet Renepet, uh, which seems to be an epidemic also um, hitting Egypt uh, a few times. This plague of the year um, is uh, demonized. And when the illnesses brought by the plague, for instance, are seen as something entering from the outside. And in this papyri, we even find explanation, glosses to the spells. So maybe for the magician, the doctor who really wanted to understand what this disease was about. And so in one gloss, for instance, it is said, as for something entering from outside, it means the, bre the breath of an outside God or death. So even gods could bring the disease. It's a very interesting um, way to think of illnesses that we find also in other societies. So this demonization of illness. We have um, other spells in the same uh, papyrus, I especially like this one, because it mentions a lot of demons indeed. It's another, it's another incantation because it comes after a first incantation, forwarding of the breath, the chow of the Jeheret disease. I didn't translate it because we are not sure what this disease is. It's very difficult to understand all these magical terms or what the magical text, what they refer to. But then we have the disease comes from uh, gang, demonic gangs, the murderers, the, so the Haitiu, the knife bringers, the incendiaries, maybe the Negesetiu, the emissaries, the Wepetiu uh, of Sekhmet. Sekhmet, the lion uh, uh, goddess, uh, which was one of the main senders of demons. So in this kind of text, uh, demon seems to be subordinated to the gods because the gods send them. So they act according to what the god want or the goddess want. And so if you read um, this appeal to the demons, uh, to the, these agents of the seas, as I call them now, is retreat. It's a very direct discourse. Retreat murderers. No breeze will reach me so that passers-by, demons, the Swao, another gang, will pass on to rage against my face. I am Horus. So here the magician becomes the god so that can fight the demon. Who passes along the wandering demons, Shemayu, of Sakmet, Horus, Horus, Papyrus Amulet of Sakmet. I am the unique one, the son of Bastet, Bastet the cat goddess. I, am, I will not die on account of you. So this is a typical phrasing for a magic spell of the end of New Kingdom, Ramesic period, uh, which generally also contain magical instructions. In this case, for instance, words to be said by a man with death, a sort of wood, in his hand, let him go outside, make the round of his house, he will not die from the plague of the year. It's a bit like modern magic. You need instructions. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Magic is performative. You need to perform, act in the ritual according to certain instructions. You cannot improvise. You have to know what to do. That's, uh, that's clear already since ancient Egypt. 
to have the magic effective. Or another very short one, always from the same papyrus, uh, that, as you can see here, a page from the Oriental Institute publication, a spell for purifying anything during the plague. And again, you have the messengers, and it says, may your messengers be burned, Sekhmet. So you want to really stop those evil uh, demonic gangs. Let your murderers retreat, bastard. No, your demon passes along to rage against my face. I'm seeing a lot of mention of Sekhmet and Bastet here. These yeah. lion and cat gods, they, they, they seem to be, did you said that they have had a, a certain control over diseases yeah. or demons? They're, um, um, they're among those goddesses with the special uh, qualities as masters of demons. Osiris too. Osiris send uh, very often messengers and uh, we have uh, then also in different periods different gods acting as masters of demons. Uh, for instance, Tutu is uh, the Sphinx god uh, but only occurring in later sources, especially in the uh, Greco-Roman period. Sekhmet and Bastet are very popular um, in, uh, in the New Kingdom in the pharaonic period, as well as Selket, for instance, the scorpion goddess. And uh, yeah, it's fun to, to read all these spells. And as you can see, what, what can you understand from the demons? You can see their names. So as I said, look at their agency through their names. You could look at their body if there were depictions, but the main difference between the inhabitants of the netherworld and those uh, uh, wandering presence on earth is that those these disease carrier demons are hardly represented. It's a sort of taboo, probably for not giving power to their images. Uh, they, you, you don't find them represented in the papyri. You find them only mentioned. Uh, they were so almost obsessed by uh, from protecting themselves from all those evil beings, uh, dangerous beings, that uh, at a certain point we found uh, a group of those uh, short, uh, small strips of papyri that were uh, rolled and brought on the neck uh, as amulet. Indeed, we, we talk about amuletic papyri. And this, uh, these are called oracular amuletic decrees because it's the god who is... Uh, saying how the newborn, since these papyri were given then to newborn, the newborn will be safe from, and then there is a sort of apotropaic list, a list of all dangers. And it very often starts with every male spirit, every male dead, every male demon, and then every female spirit, every female dead, every female demon is here, a word, weret, which belongs to special kind of, one of those creatures that we can consider agents of disease uh, and uh, punishment. Every kind of death, every kind of illness, uh, uh, also every god and goddess who assumes manifestation, iribao, to manifest but as something dangerous uh, is an expression we found a lot in uh, magical text. And also interesting how they were concerned about protecting, protecting themselves from uh, all kind of magic. In this sense, in this case, I think it more, more black magic is intended. So magic as uh, harm of a person, because magic in ancient Egypt is part of religion, is part of ritual practices in the temples, but the magic of a Syrian, the magic of a Nubian, the magic of a Libyan, so foreign magic is dangerous, but also the magic of the people of Egypt, we found that too. So they, they were really scared about a lot of stuff having to do with uh, demons as well. And we have also objects, not only text. So for instance, uh, this really cute uh, feeding cup, it's really nice, it uh, seems to be made for drinking milk for a baby. It was found near tombs, uh, uh, at least in the Middle Kingdom, it's now at the Metropolitan Museum. And it's decorated with uh, protective figures of uh, apotropaic protective demons and gods, protective creatures uh, that we found also on another very popular magical object from ancient Egypt, the so-called ivory wand or magic wand, maybe used around the bed uh, to protect 
uh, the um, someone who is sleeping as well. We we don't know exactly. So that there is uh, so much. We have so many sources in ancient Egypt uh, to discuss demons, to create a demonology. So to again catalog them because the Egyptian didn't do it. They didn't need to. I'd like to conclude by discussing briefly what we call magical thinking, which has revealed to be so important for understanding why in times of plagues and pandemics like the one we are currently living in, people, ancient and modern, feel the need to ask help to their gods or god, as well as to demonize plagues and disease and attempt to appease or ward off those demons with the help of a magician and of his spells. A classic of anthropology, Malinowski's essay on science, magic and religion, made clear how in the early 20th century people turned to magic when they feel powerless. And referring to magical thinking can help us to understand also what demons represented in ancient Egypt and how the, the fears and needs of the ancient Egyptians weren't so different from those of other people from the past and of today's society. And I'm very fond of, um, of TV series in general. Lately I've been uh, watching Evil on Netflix, the story of a forensic psychologist and an aspiring priest who investigate mysteries for the Catholic Church in order to determine if there are demonic possession or something more logical to explain. In one of the final scenes, the psychologist meets with his own therapist only to discover that he's a demon. And I love the image of him in front of the goat-like, horned, hairy, satanic creature from hell, taking notes on an iPad even in another scene, because demons can also be scientists. And it is uh, the eternal connection, I think, that humankind has been able to establish among fields that seem so far away from each other, but they are not, uh, which is science, magic, and religion. And so for me, studying ancient Egyptian demons, it means to learn more about such a splendid mix of ideas, knowledges, and beliefs that makes ancient Egyptian civilization still so intriguing and especially still so modern. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu member.